I'm going to show you how bacteria are good for you. Look at all of these people. Now, they all look different, but they all have something in common. Every single one of them is covered in millions of bacteria. We all are. But don't worry, this is completely normal. In fact, we need bacteria to survive. Now, this is a Petri dish, named after its inventor, Julius Richard Petri. Doctors like me use these dishes to grow bacteria and see what lives on our bodies. That's what I'm going to do now, starting with our lips. Who's going to give me a kiss? Anyone going to give me a kiss? What I want is a kiss, a nice big kiss on that. What we're trying to do is look at what grows in people's mouths and things like that. Carrots. <laughs> Carrots? <laughs> Will anyone give you a kiss? I'll ask your girlfriend for a kiss. A more manly kiss from you, all right? <clears throat> Can we get a nose pick as well? It's less exciting than a kiss. <gasps> Just going to see what comes out of people's noses and what comes out of their mouths. I can't do all this in the straight cotton put up my nose. Come on. Oh, you are good. That's gross. He's a nice man, isn't he? Yeah. Oh, thanks. The kisses and nose swabs will now go off to be grown in a special laboratory. And after five days, it's time to see how the bacteria have blossomed. This is Dr Richard Drew, microbiologist and expert in all things gross. And now the kisses have gone all furry. Well, that's bacteria for you. <laughs> So what kind of bugs have we got here? We have a lot of streptococci, which is kind of the slightly greeny colour around the lips. But up here where their nose would have been, you can see the yellowy cogs growing. And these ones are more like a Staphylococcus aureus. Sounds like a dinosaur. It's completely normal to have these bugs in your mouth, so all of us have them. We could have got a kiss from everyone in Liverpool and they all would have grown these two bacteria. Absolutely. You might think it's disgusting, but bacteria are really useful. They're important to have. For example, we've got bugs in our gut and they help to digest food. And they fight disease too, by increasing the acidity in your gut to the point bad bacteria don't want to move in. So what about the weird things that live up our nose? This one we found a lot of E. coli and a lot of Staphylococcus as well. Now, E. coli can be dangerous. They do cause disease, but living up your nose or, commonly, living up your bottom is completely normal and completely safe. It's when it gets into blood or other bits of your body which shouldn't have it, like the brain or the joints, that it can cause problems. This one looks like cheesecake. Mmm, yummy. So our bodies are covered in bacteria, but that's not just normal. It's good because our bodies are amazing at protecting the bits that need to be protected, which is why kissing is fine. A bit disgusting, but fine. Ouch. Uh, this is a state-of-the-art rapid response vehicle. It can get to the scene of a medical emergency in minutes. And I'm heading out in it to show you what it's like to be a life-saving paramedic. Jan can take 10 to 15 emergency call-outs in a day, and a new case is just in. We've had a 999 call to see a 32-year-old man who's got a rash and swelling in his mouth. Now, that sounds to me like an allergic reaction. So I've got my camera in the front, Eric has got his camera, and we're going to be getting you as close to the action as possible. Only a couple of minutes later, and we arrive at our destination. Hello, is it Alan? Yeah. Take a seat. My name's Jan. What's the problem today? Uh, I thought I had, like, a rash or something. Uh, your yeah, tongue was swelling. Have My throat look. feels a bit... Tight. Have you mind right as you can? Uh, uh, so your tongue feels big in your mouth, does it? Yeah, my ear feels quite tight. OK. I was a bit short of breath, but... Alan is experiencing something called anaphylactic shock, an extreme allergic reaction. Tigger and Sasha look concerned. So is there anything that you're aware of that you're allergic to? No, 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 nothing no. that you know of? No. Although Alan's being pretty brave, he has a life-threatening condition. His lips and tongue can swell, and that causes problems with breathing and swallowing. So it's actually really important that Jan's here. What I'll do is I'm going to give you an injection into your arm in a second okay. <clears throat> with a drug called adrenaline. Now, you may have heard of adrenaline. It's actually a hormone that your body makes. What it's doing, in Alan's case, is constricting the blood vessels in his tongue, in his lips, and will actually reduce that swelling. In cases like this, it can be life-saving. I'm sending um, Alan in the hospital today just so that I can make sure his tongue doesn't swell again. So the drugs I've given only work for a short time. 
How are you feeling, Alan? Do you feel like it's working? Yeah, I do feel a little, a lot of swelling's going down. Yeah. An ambulance has arrived to take Alan into hospital. You'll be right walking out, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Fine, yeah. It's potentially a life-threatening problem that he had, and Jan's really fixed him up. You could see how much the swelling in his lips had gone down, and that happens all the way down his throat and into his lungs. So that's really, really good news, and they'll be able to treat him really well in hospital. Your body can need mending in all sorts of ways, and we're going to meet some special teams that are trained to fix you. <laughs> Speaking is one of the most complicated things you can do, and while I bet you know that your lips and tongue and voice box are all involved, I bet you don't know what your soft palate does, or even where it is. Well, open your mouth and say ah. Uh... See that? It's where the dangly bit hangs from. And most of us use it without even thinking about it. But today, we're going to meet a patient who's learning to use hers. Nine-year-old Millie is in speech therapy after she was born with a cleft palate. This means she had a hole going through the roof of her mouth to her nose. She's had a series of operations to fix this. However, Millie still finds speaking a little bit difficult. There are some sounds that you find really easy and some sounds that you find difficult. And I find the S. Word more difficult than other words. And that's, that's the one you've been working on today, isn't it? Yeah. When you make a speech sound like an S, the soft palate needs to lift up and make a seal with the back of the throat. In Millie's case, she isn't able to do that. So when air comes up, it isn't directed just into her mouth, it also escapes down her nose as well. To help her with that, she's working with speech therapist Jane O'Connell. Today I've joined the class and Jane's set us a challenge. I've got to make up a sentence for each of these words. And then I'll be better than you. <laughs> and I use powerful adjectives as well. Oh, you might use powerful adjectives? Yeah. I don't think I know any powerful adjectives. <laughs> so. My dad showed um, the word to make a door. My dad sawed the word to make a door. Good sentence. Now it's my turn. Uh, I saw the sun shining in the sky. No, I saw. What is showing? Millie's having none of it. So I can't say I saw the sun. No. No, I meant like I saw the sun. No, that doesn't work. Does it? Well, you tried. I think I need my homework more than Millie. <laughs> there are other sounds that most of us take for granted, but again, our bodies have to do more than you'd think. Make a mmm sound for me. Mmm. OK, what happens if I hold your nose? Listen to what happens to mm. that sound. Mm. Oh, I, can't, I can't do it. No. What would normally happen is the air would come down your nose, but because I'm holding your nose, I'm blocking the air from coming down. And it actually turns that sound into almost a b sound. So try that at home. Make a mmm sound. And the mmm sound is a nasal sound where the air does have to come out your nose. And if you block your nose, mm. Mm. you can't make the sound, so it becomes a b as the air escapes. So the really difficult thing that Millie's having to learn is to consciously control muscles that most people don't even know exist, like the muscles at the top and the back of your mouth. And so that is quite a skill to master. Before we finish, Millie's got her own speaking challenge for me. OK, so I've got to say red lorry and yellow lorry. That's fast. Fast. <laughs> red lorry, yellow lorry. Red Roy Leather Lorry. Red. Oh, I can't do it. Oh, she beat me again. Good luck, Millie. And now to our lab, oh. where we do incredible experiments. Oh, looks disgusting. To show you how your body works. Just don't try anything you see here at home. I'm going to show you something about sneezing that you won't know. And Zan, I'm pretty sure that even as a doctor, you won't know this either. First of all, I need to get Zahn to sneeze. So why don't you try rolling up the corner of this piece of tissue paper and stick it in your nose. Really? Zahn, <laughs> cover your mouth. Oh, I'm covered in spit. So what happened there? I put something up my nose and my body just blew it out because I didn't like it. How does it clear your nose? Right, like you sort of go <laughs> like that and just blow everything out your nose. That's what you think happens. Yeah. This is really good. So even doctors honestly think this happens when you sneeze, and that is completely wrong. 
so you don't blow anything out your nose when you sneeze. Everything comes out your mouth. And we can prove it to you if you look at this video of me sneezing. OK, here we go. I'm going. I'm going. I've gone. That's all saliva that was in my mouth, but nothing is coming out of my nose. It's only after I sneeze that my body will create mucus to flush out whatever irritated my nose in the first place. And that's when snot will come out of my nostrils. So we've shown you that when you sneeze, the spray only comes out your mouth. But imagine if Chris had been ill when he sneezed. Every single one of those droplets could have contained disease-spreading germs. And that's why it's so important to cover your mouth. Now we're going to show you just how big and powerful a sneeze can be. We're going to create our own work of art. We'll both drink different coloured liquids, then get a sneeze going to create our masterpiece. Get ready for germ art. OK, so you're going to go first. <laughs> That's really good. Thanks. Now you'll notice an amazing splatter effect, and that's all down to the speed our sneezes are travelling. 100 kilometres an hour, to be precise. And remember, if we were ill, that would all be germs. I really like what you've done there, though. You've really um, drawn... the nose right. <laughs> I don't know why everyone doesn't paint this way. Now, with all this sneezing, look what started to happen. Yep, snot. And that's the mucus our bodies have created to flush out what was making us sneeze. I hope we've painted for you a clear picture of why it's so important to cover your mouth when you sneeze. Use a tissue or do it into your elbow. Got a little snot. <laughs> Don't try anything you see here at home. To kick off today's lab, we're using this machine to see what's in our breath. Your breath has lots of gases in it. Some are smelly, like hydrogen sulphide. It's made by the bacteria that live in your mouth, and it's what makes the bad smell when you let one rip. When it's mixed with the food and drink you've eaten, it can make your breath honk. Let's look at Chris's results. Chris, you have detectable levels of fishy cabbage smell in your breath. Oh, nice. Thanks, Sand. But actually, your breath can tell you much more than what you've had for dinner, as we're going to show you. What's going on? Who's this? This is Daisy. Am I being replaced? What are your qualifications? Susan, you're not being replaced. Daisy's here to help us with today's experiment. Because your breath can reveal a huge amount about you. It can be the first sign of many illnesses. And, like your fingerprints, your breath is unique. No one else has the same breath. <sighs> it smells like doggy snacks. No. But I did find some lovely biscuits on the floor on the way in. Were they in a bowl? Yes. Did the bowl say Daisy on it? Yes. <sighs> Now, everyone has bad breath at some point, even Daisy. But even if your breath isn't bad, it still has a smell, and it's the smell that contains information about you and your health. So, if you have asthma, even though you can't smell asthma, your breath will have more nitric oxide in it, which you can detect. Or, if you have diabetes, your breath may have more of a compound called acetone in it. It's the same chemical that's in nail varnish remover. In fact, there's a whole range of medical conditions that can be detected on your breath. But not by us, even though we're doctors. Not by specialist medical researchers, not even by complicated equipment. That's why Daisy is here. She's a specially trained smell dog tour. Daisy's been trained by Claire to detect serious illnesses like cancer in a person's breath. So, Claire, how does Daisy do it? Well, when people are unwell, they smell different. So some people have kindly donated their breath samples onto this tube. So they breathe in that and then the, the smelly molecules in their breath stick inside this sponge here. Absolutely. And then what we do is, in training, we show this sponge to Daisy and we've been able to train her to tell us if somebody has a very serious disease. Time to see Daisy in action. Now, we've laid out three samples of breath here. And one of the samples is from a patient with a serious illness. Now, the one from the patient with the illness... Chris! You can't say in front of Daisy. She'll hear. She's better find it herself. Son, she's a dog. She doesn't speak English. It's sample A. Now, Claire, should we set off Daisy and see if she can find it? Daisy, seek, seek. Mm. 
She's done it. And unbelievably, it took her just six seconds. That's amazing. There was no debate. There was no, she didn't even have to check one of the samples. Yeah, she yeah. knew. As soon as she smelt that odor, she sits down and tells us she's found it. So, while Daisy is special, she's not actually got any more smell receptors than any other dog. Take Sooty and Spike here. Although they might be better at sniffing out where their ball is than detecting illness, inside their noses they have 220 million smell receptors, whereas we only have 5 million. And there are other dogs like Daisy who've been trained to sniff out different medical conditions. So if someone has diabetes, for instance, and they have the wrong level of sugar in their blood, the dog could actually detect that and warn them to take their medication. So although your breath can sometimes smell bad, its smell can also reveal vital information about your health. Claire, that was brilliant. Thank you so yeah, much for coming you. in. Daisy, you did such a good job.